chapter, verses 11 through 21. Let us read this together and listen for God's word to us today. Then I saw, oh, together. <laughs> then I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name inscribed that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, wearing fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has the name inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in his son, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly in mid-heaven, Come and gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of the mighty, the flesh of horses and their riders, flesh of all, both free and slave, both small and great. Then I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against the rider on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had formed in his presence the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive in the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were killed by the sword of the rider on the horse, the sword that came from his mouth, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. This is the word of God. <laughs> Please be seated. Please pray with me and for me. Dear Lord, uplift me, uphold me, that I may uplift thee. Amen. Tom Long is a great Presbyterian preacher. Do you know him? A great professor, uh, he's a great preacher, and he's a professor of homiletics at Handler Seminary in Atlanta. A student came up to him one day and said, Dr. Long, I'm preaching my first sermon. Do you have any advice? Sure, Long replied. Keep it under 20 minutes, tell the truth, and never drop an F-bomb from the pulpit. <laughs> These are words to live by. I'm proud to say that I have never broken any of those rules. There are, however, a few rules of preaching that I have broken. We are taught in seminary never to use animals, children, or fire during a sermon. And as some of you know, I've done all three. <laughs> there are two other rules of preaching that I'm going to break this morning. The first is never to preach on something you're not finished with emotionally. If you talk to your shrink about it, don't tell it to the congregation. And the second is, never be the hero of your own anecdote. I'm breaking these rules, perhaps not wisely, but I am breaking them in the service of keeping it real. I think it's important to keep it real, especially when preaching on something as out there as the revelation to John. We Presbyterians don't preach often on the revelation. It's almost completely missing from the lectionary. The book is just too weird for us, too non-linear. 
where you've basically abdicated the popular interpretation of the last book of our canon to Hollywood and to the Baptists. No wonder that so many young people think Armageddon has something to do with stopping a giant meteor from hitting the Earth. Armageddon is actually a great plain at the bottom of the Kindron Valley between Galilee and Samaria, where several important battles have been fought in the ancient world. And it isn't that surprising that John chooses that place as the site of the final battle between good and evil, the battle we read about this morning. Basically, the whole book of Revelation till this point has been humanity not repenting. Despite terrible consequences, we haven't repented because of sin and deceit. Now the forces of evil are arrayed on the battlefield to wipe out goodness. Everything looks grim. Then, at the beginning of this morning's reading, Christ arrives on a white horse, followed by the armies of heaven, that is literally the heavenly host. And guess what? The good guys win. The key verse this morning is Revelation 19.20, the second half. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. Sulfur is brimstone in the uh, uh, King James vernacular. So these two are the beast and the false prophet. Now, they're basically Batman and Robin of evil. <laughs> Do not worry about whether they represent Emperors Nero and Caligula, or Vladimir Putin and Steve Jobs. That is not the point. They're just the bad guys. And the lake that burns with sulfur, that's the place where things don't matter anymore. That's off stage. That's out of the story. Is it a lake of water with burning sulfur on top? Or is it a lake of molten sulfur like you see in the Star Wars movies? I mean, how can you suffer for eternity if you get burned up instantly in this lake? Maybe it's an analogy for nuclear war. Do not worry about that stuff. What matters is that the lake of sulfur is, the, what matters is that things that are thrown into the lake of sulfur are not our problem anymore. They are out of the picture. In the next chapter, Satan, death, and Hades also get tossed in the lake of fire. None of the bad guys escape. Who is doing the throwing? Christ, the rider on the white horse, our Lord and Savior, the holy warrior. So a fully unpacked interpretation of our verse might be something like this. At the Battle of Armageddon, Christ takes all of the bad guys and puts them where they do not matter anymore. It just sounds much cooler to say the beast and the false prophets were thrown in the lake of burning sulfur. But regardless of how it sounds, friends, this is the victory. What is the book of Revelation about? It's about people under the power of sin and evil. The forces of evil gather around. Christ destroys them. The denouement is a new heaven, a new earth. It's all good. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the story of the empty tomb. Christ is resurrected, breaking the power of sin and death. It's the gospel. God wins. Or as Paul says in my favorite verse in all scripture, Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now it's true, the victory is not complete. It's not yet complete. We see evidence of sin and death every day. The victory is not complete, but it is assured. So here's my one sports analogy for the year. Get ready. <laughs> We're up 100 to nothing at the end of the fourth quarter. Sure, the game is still going on, but we have already won. So here's the question I pose to you this morning. How, how do we live in a victory? 
That's the title of the sermon. Living in Victory. There are basically two answers to this question, two approaches that Christians have taken. I completely reject the first, and I embrace the second. The first approach is often called the escape hatch theory, the escape hatch theology. Or as I like to call it, it's the life sucks and then you die theology. According to this approach, the good news is that after we die, we go to heaven. At some time, Christ will ultimately defeat, at some time in the future, Christ will ultimately defeat evil and everything will be great. Until then, we can endure anything on earth because the promise of heaven keeps us going. Grin and bear it. Live for heaven. It will all happen worth it when we get there. This escape theology, this escape hatch theology, reveals itself in some of our favorite hymns. Just a few more weary days, and then I'll fly away. The world is not my home, I'm just passing through. My treasure are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Our spirits will sorrow no more. Not a sign for the blessing of rest and sweet blind eye. We will be on that beautiful shore. I read this week that Christians don't lie in church, they just sing their lies. Christians don't say lies in church, they just sing their lies. And to some extent that's true. I reject this theology because Scripture tells us that our lives are a gift from God. A gift to be enjoyed, not merely endured. God created the earth and called it good. The world is my home. Yeah, it's broken. But our job isn't to tolerate it. As our Jewish brothers and sisters would say, our job is to repair it. And this brings us to option number two. How else could we react to the knowledge that God and Christ will ultimately win no matter what we do? We can simply try our best to glorify God, or as I like to say, to please God. Now, let me be clear, in the scope of salvation history, our works will have no effect at all. God is going to win. But isn't it better to spend our time, treasures, and talents pleasing God in the meantime? Now, this is where I start to break the rules. Because I'm going to talk about myself and my workers to work ministry as an example of what it looks like to live is what this looks like in the real world. I want to tell you about my efforts to please God. So Jesus said if you have two coats, you just share one with someone who has none. And I knew some people with extra cars. So I decided to figure a way to provide these cars to people who needed them to get to work. And this developed into a little nonprofit that I ran for seven years to work. I invested a lot of time, energy, and money into this undertaking. New Covenant has been a great partner. Many of you have donated money and cars, for which I am eternally grateful. We ultimately served close to 100 families. I had hoped to grow it to a million families. Didn't work out that way. Now, theologically, there are two problems with my plan to please God. First, one of my ecologically minded friends asked me if I really thought it would please God to put a million more gas guzzling, polluting cars and trucks on the road. And that got me to think. Do I really know what is pleasing to God? Can I know what God is thinking? And what does it say in Isaiah? God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. And how many historical examples can we think of where people committed atrocities 
while believing they were pleasing God. Burning witches, separating Native American children from their parents. Did you know that the Nazi soldiers wore the German words, thought mit uns, God with us, on their belt buckles during World War II? God with us on Nazi belt buckles. We need to have some humility with our claims. I really couldn't be confident that what I was doing was pleasing God. And the second problem with trying to please God this way was that workers were completely collapsed. It failed. Now, some of my friends and family take issue with that. They say, oh, you didn't fail. You helped so many people. Maybe. Nonetheless, I think we can all agree that we don't have a million cars on the road, and the ministry is not currently operating. Maybe Christ will resurrect it next week or next year, but right now, Workers to Work is not giving anybody cars. Do you want to know what living in victory looks like for me? I've got a couple of vandalized cars sitting on a piece of property that I cannot sell. On my desk, there is a stack of toll bills that almost reaches the ceiling, and I have no idea what I'm going to do when I grow up. It is a train wreck. And guess what? I'm good with it. Okay, to be perfectly honest, I'm not always good with it. Sometimes I'm depressed, I have a lot of regret, I'm not sure what the future holds, I'm anxious, all that's true. But when I listen to the angels of my better nature, I'm okay with it. Why? Revelation 19. Christ has already defeated, defeated sin and death, and through my baptism, through our baptism, we get to play on the winning team. Christ has given us the ultimate victory. I do not need to win again. And the second reason that I'm okay with the way things have turned out is that what I really want more than anything is to stand before the throne of grace at the end of time and hear God say the words to me, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, there are plenty of things I could have done to have made workers to work more successful in human terms. You may not be surprised to hear that the automotive industry is rock from the bottom to the top. From the boardrooms of the largest automakers to the guy on the side of the road offering to pop that dent out of your bumper for 25 bucks. We could have made it a lot further if we had played by those rules. When selling cars, when dealing with insurance companies, junkyards, so many opportunities to cheat. And everyone's doing it. How is it fair if they get to cheat and we don't? Well, it's not about fair. Whenever I had a temptation to rip somebody off, which was daily, <laughs> I just imagined myself explaining my Christian labor labors to Jesus on Judgment Day. Jesus, I helped a ton of people with their transportation needs. And all I had to do was defraud a couple of insurance companies and conceal catastrophic problems in cars before I sold them and steal a few car parts. I'm pretty sure Jesus would not be that impressed. So maybe workers to work did not bear enough fruit. Maybe the return on investment wasn't very high. Maybe God hates cars and actually called me to give away bicycles, but I got confused. I don't know about all that. But I do know, to the point of human certainty, that my desire to please God pleases God. Our desire to please God pleases God. As we read in 1 Samuel, God sees the heart. So the first re reason that I'm okay with the demise of workers to work is that Christ has already won the victory. The second reason 
Is that my desire to please God pleases God? There's a third reason. On my best days, I'm okay with the workers to work meltdown. The reason I'm okay with it is that the world needs new ministries, new ideas, new ways of thinking. If we're going to change the world to make it more like the kingdom of God, if we're going to repair it, then we've got to do some things differently. And doing new things is risky. Odds of success are not good. Generally, 9 out of 10 new undertakings fail. But on the flip side, 1 out of 10 works. The problem, of course, is we don't know which one. And that is why we have to try them all. If you have a new idea of a way to serve God, you have got to try it. Because it might be the one out of ten that changes the world. And this is the practical part of the sermon. What is the take home? How should God's word change the way we live? The message is simple. Grab that dream for ministry that you've always had and do it. Risk it. Take the chance. Go for it. If people tell you it will never work, they are probably right. Do it anyway. Look around this congregation for inspiration. Don't look at your workers to work. It's all but dead. But look at the amazing number of ministries that have succeeded. Mary and Randy and the Football League. Callie and the Community Health Workers. Bernie, his healing touch. Lydia, the Monastery Christo, the Karoons in Sudan, Jimmy and Kimberly in Ethiopia, Genevieve with their camps and schools. Heck, New Covenant itself is a testament to trying to please God, despite a 90% chance of failure. Be inspired by these examples. The message I wish to leave you with is this. Do not let fear of failure stop you from trying to please God in a new way. Because through Christ, we already have the victory. Amen, amen and amen.